All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're looking at some new ideas and trying to relate this stuff to rockets because rockets are totally cool. What we're looking at is momentum and impulse. Now, momentum is a word you've heard before many times, I'm sure, but impulse, maybe not. So I want to take you back to something familiar, though. You recognize this. Okay, one of the most important equations in all of physics, Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. And yes, really, this should be the net force, but okay. Also, regarding acceleration, you know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So we have a change in velocity over a time interval. Now, I'm going to include the delta symbol on the t. And, and you see me in class, and I often don't have that in front of the t. But let's stay uh, a little formal with this for the moment. Now, because of these two things, I actually could make a quick substitution. And I could say, well, instead of the a, what if I wrote this stuff and put it in that equation? And so I have, therefore, force equals mass times this business. Okay, so it's an interesting way of looking at it because I can rearrange this and I can, I can come up with something new. I can actually sh uh, show momentum in here as well as impulse. This equation is going to kind of break down for us nicely. What I'm going to do is multiply both sides by delta t. So I have mass times delta v. Now this is interesting. What this tells you is that if you have a force that you apply for a certain period of time and you're, that force is acting on a certain mass, the mass will experience a certain change in velocity. It might be at rest in the beginning and then start moving. It might already be moving, but its velocity will change. So uh, this is cool. Now, what we see though is that a larger force for a given period of time is going to produce a larger change in velocity. Uh, for a constant force, if we apply that force for more time, we will produce a larger change in velocity. So you can play with the amount of force, you can play with the amount of time. Now also, for larger masses, you'll either need more force or more time to produce a certain change in velocity. Okay, so that's how this equation really works. Now, uh, there's some interesting stuff going on because what we know about rockets, if you're going to launch a rocket, your initial velocity is typically zero. Uh, it starts on the launch pad, okay meters per second, right? Got to have the units. Now, uh, they also, after launching, they attain some maximum final velocity. So there is a final. Now, I'm, I'm using the, the sort of the label of final velocity, but it really isn't a final velocity. It's, it's really a maximum. Think of that as a maximum velocity. And there will be some maximum velocity. So, we don't know what it's going to be. We have no data we're dealing with yet. But after the fuel in the rocket's engine burns out, it's no longer accelerating. There's no longer a force being produced. Okay, so so at that instant, it will have that final velocity. Now, it's, it's moving pretty good. But you know it's going to be slowing down. It continues to fly higher, but it slows down. And so all kinds of things change. But that really will be a maximum velocity then. Now, the interesting thing, though, is... Uh, over on this side of the equation, we have this mass times this change of velocity, but that triangle, that delta symbol, that thing can be moved around. And what we can do is we can put it in front, we can say, well, what if we have a change in mass times velocity, like that? And the interesting reason for doing that is because, well, this quantity right here is momentum. the mass times velocity part. So that's cool. Now momentum has its own symbol. Lowercase p, and I don't know why it's a p. M is taken by mass, um, and so maybe I guess physicists were running out of letters to use. So lowercase p, and so what we have is momentum equals mass times velocity. So on the launch pad, does the rocket have momentum? No, its momentum is zero because its velocity is zero. After the instant the fuel in the engine runs out, does it have momentum? Yes, because it has a velocity, it has that maximum velocity. 
and you multiply by the mass and you get the amount of momentum that it has. So what happens though is because of the, the force, and the force is the thrust of the engine, because of that force, rockets experience a change in momentum. And that motor applies that force over a period of time, so force times time. The fuel eventually burns up and you stop applying that force and you stop changing the rocket's momentum. Cool, huh? Well, this is an important equation that you want to remember. That's the equation for momentum. All right. It's worth memorizing. It's worth remembering. Now, I'm going to go back to this guy, though. I need some more room. So, force times the time interval equals... And what I want to do is I want to say, uh, I'll, I'll keep that triangle out in front here, change in mass times velocity. Cool. So we saw this on the right side. So we saw that this really translates into change in momentum. That's how you would read that, literally. That's what that side means. What about this side? Force times time. So uh, this deal right here has its own name. And this is your impulse. And this is uh, it's, it's, some, it's a real thing in physics. Impulse is a force applied for a certain period of time. And this is different than some other stuff. I mean, you recall, for example, I'm going to do this off on the side. If you did a force times a distance, that gets you work, doesn't it? And so it will also, um, force times distance will cause a change in energy. Well, work changes energy of an object, sure. And there's all kinds of other stuff. There's a different kind of force times distance kind of thing you could do, and that's gonna get you torque. Now, we didn't study this, but uh, we're not doing distance. We're doing time. And so it's it's a completely different thing. Don't worry about those items here. Or at least not right now. So impulse. Force times time is impulse. Now, the, this is a weird thing. You, you often don't run into this. The symbol for impulse is a capital J. And this is going to screw people up. I'm sorry. It, it's just, it is what it is. This is not joules. This is not a unit. This is a symbol. All right, here we go again. Physicists kind of running out of bright ideas. I don't, I don't know. This symbol is often not used. I actually think you don't even see this in your textbook. Um, maybe because the authors of the textbook decided, you know what, throwing around another capital J is just going to mess with people's heads a little too much, more than necessary. Well, the units of impulse, well, look at this. We have force, which is measured in newtons, and time is measured in seconds. So our units will be newton seconds. And there really isn't any way to combine those in, in, a, in a nice single thing. So you just say newton seconds. That's, that's literally what you say. So uh, if impulse equals change in momentum, impulse equals change in momentum, then the units must be the same. Are they the same? So let's check that out. Do we have... Uh, the same thing on each side. So we have impulses, newtons, times seconds. And here we have mass times velocity. Mass is kilograms, and velocity is meters per second. Uh, the triangle here has no units. It's just signifying there's a change in something. Okay, so uh, this one's easy. This is going to be kilogram meters per second. How about this? Well, this is newton seconds, not divided by seconds, not per second. This is per second. That's not per second. Well, what is a newton? A newton, if you recall, is a kilogram meter per second squared. And we're multiplying that by seconds. Are these two the same? Well, yeah, it turns out they are. You can pretty readily see that uh, that second will cancel with one of those. And you're left with kilogram meters per second, kilogram meters per second. They are the same. It checks out. Boom. So that's an, uh, a nice way to confirm what's going on. Okay, well, back to rockets, because that's the cool part, right? Let's do that. The thing about rockets, 
is uh, the engines that they use. The, the, the engine is where the thrust comes from. Here's a typical model rocket engine. And it's not terribly impressive all by itself. If you look at one end, it's, it's basically a, just a cardboard tube. You look at one end and you see a, a smallish hole. That's the nozzle. That's where the exhaust from the engine comes out. And this is supposed to be pointed uh, toward the back end of the rocket. And essentially, you know, Newton's third law is what drives the rocket forward. The engine shoots out a whole bunch of hot gases at very high velocity out the nozzle. And because there's a force pushing back, Newton's third law says, well, there's a force pushing forward, and that's the force that acts on the rocket, that accelerates the rocket upward. That's the thrust. There's a little dirt coming out of this guy. So the engine. All right, now let's talk about this for just a minute because it's interesting. On all of these engines, you see a little designation. Here's one that says A83. Here's one that says C65. And those designations mean something. So let's check that out real quick. I use the green. Let's go with the green. You always see, um, well, I should say almost always, you see a letter, a number, and then a hyphen and another number. So uh, here's the deal. The first thing, the letter, signifies the impulse that the engine provides. The first number signifies the average thrust. And thrust is just a force. Right. Oh, but oh, I should say average for the impulse as well. Average impulse, average thrust. And then the final number. Well, okay, so think about what's going on here with these engines. Inside the engine, you essentially have, check this out. You essentially have, um, if we look at it like this, the, the clay nozzle with the opening in the end, and that's where the hot exhaust, exhaust gases come out. Then all the fuel. Okay, and after the fuel burns up, there's a delay charge. So this is burning, but it's not really producing thrust. It's not very powerful. There's not a lot of energy stored in this material. But it is burning, and as it burns, it finally gets to this extra little bit of uh, fuel, and it's an ejection charge. It burns very rapidly, almost like a tiny explosion. And what it does is it overpressurizes the interior of the engine, and it blows off the clay cap. When the ejection charge burns, it cannot get out of the nozzle fast enough, pressure builds in the chamber and it blows off this clay cap and basically it ejects out of the front of the rocket the parachute or whatever recovery system it uses. So that's not the important part. The important part here is the fuel, the main fuel producing the thrust. So the average impulse, well this, this is going to burn for a certain period of time. So you have uh, a force that's going to produce, in, oh by the way force is measured in newtons force measured in newtons there, and the impulse measured in newton seconds for the units there. But the third number, the third number here is the time of the delay. So how long it takes the delay to burn through. And delay time in seconds. Uh, it actually is an important number, not not so critical for uh, the, the thrust phase at all, but, but it's, it's nice to balance that with other aspects of your rocket. Don't want to get into that right now. But these are the basics of rocket engines and how they work. So you, by looking at the engine, you can see the impulse delivered by the engine, the average thrust that the engine produces, and those two numbers together uh, can be used to, to help you figure some things out. Let's do that. So, there we go. So what can we learn from this? So we know that impulse is going to produce a change in momentum. And that's supposed to be just a V, sorry. Okay, well really that's a, a change in momentum. I can do the P if I want. So uh, we, we want to know what to expect. We want to know how this is going to affect the rocket. If we assume that mass is constant, oh wow, that doesn't look like an M. If we assume that mass is constant, now here's the thing. As the engine uses its fuel and the hot exhaust gas is coming out the nozzle, it's getting lighter, it's losing mass. 
but it's a small amount. If we assume m is constant, then we can find a delta v. So this is pretty cool. We also, so we'll make it two assumptions here. Assumptions. One, mass is constant. And that we know that's not really true, but we can fudge that deal. So the second assumption is this, that the initial velocity will be zero. The rocket's going to start at zero velocity, zero meters per second. That's not really um, an assumption per se. It's, it's, it's going to be the truth. We're going to start the rockets when they're standing still. Um, but it helps us make a prediction. You're going to see that right now. So check this out. Let's look at an example. And so we can, we can put this together. Watch this. Let's take an A83 engine and a rocket with a mass of, oh, let's say, 60 grams. Now, it doesn't sound like much. Rockets are supposed to be pretty light. But that's including the engine. That's the total mass. OK, so I want to convert that to kilograms right away. Okay, so what's going to happen? So we're going to, the engine will supply uh, an impulse based on the letter. Now the letter A typically represents an impulse of around 2.5 Newton seconds. Okay, so we also know that the 8 is the average force, 8 Newtons. Alright, from these two numbers we could actually figure out uh, the amount of time that the fuel will burn, but that's not what we really need uh, so We can just directly use that because we're looking for a change in velocity here So we have that we have the impulse already. We're gonna say that uh, Impulse equals Mass and we're putting the triangle in front of the the velocity remember mass is going to be constant but well, I want to find the delta V. I want to find that. So I'll have to do impulse, divide, impulse divided by mass. And what I'm going to say is, well, I got 2.5 Newton seconds divided by the mass, which I said was 0, 0.60 kilograms. And that's my delta V. OK. So what I get here is a delta V of 41, round numbers, 41.7 meters per second. Uh, this is interesting. And so really, since initial velocity was zero, the final velocity will equal the change in velocity. So how fast is this rocket going? at its maximum speed when all the fuel just burns up and it's no longer producing thrust. We can say that the final velocity, therefore the final velocity, three dots for therefore, is 41.7 meters per second. We can predict that, I, I'm in the habit of saying final velocity, we can predict that maximum velocity, that really is a max velocity. Velocity, I can spell. Cool. So we just have to know the mass of the rocket, and we have to know the engine that we're using, and we can estimate what that fastest speed of the rocket's going to be. That's pretty cool. And we didn't have to actually have to measure its performance. Now, what we could do then is, of course, try to find that maximum velocity in, in uh, an experimental way. We could measure that, if possible, and uh, see how close our prediction came to the real thing. That's it for now. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you next time.